not listening to me. Um, I'm asking that everybody take their seats, we're going to get started. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome, I'm Cheryl Milne, the Executive Director of the David Asper Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, I'm really excited about today's program. I want to thank all of the contributors who uh, proposed such interesting and uh, such a variety of papers. Uh, the papers, we have a plan for publication of the papers. Um, some of the longer papers um, are going to be um, published in the Supreme Court Law Review. And then the, the longer ones along with the shorter ones, we're hoping to um, produce a, a soft cover book following um, the Supreme Court Law Review as well. So we're, we're really excited about having a resource about public interest litigation uh, in Canada. Um, just some logistics. You'll see at the top of your program, the schedule, um, there is the information if you want to connect to Wi-Fi throughout the conference today. Um, and also if you want to access the papers. We've password protected them so that those of you who have registered and are part of the conference get privileged access to the papers. It's not out there uh, to the general public. A lot of them are in very much a draft um, stage, so in, please ensure that if you plan to cite them or use them that you contact the authors directly to seek permission for that. Um, I'm also happy to uh, announce that the Law Society of Ontario um, has accredited two of our sessions for professionalism. That's the um, the Vulnerable um, Litigants and Groups session and the um, Housing um, Rights session are both, both have professionalism hours. Quite frankly, many of the sessions today probably could have fit that, but we went conservative on, on seeking accredi accreditation for professionalism just because it's a bit of a, um, <laughs> an administrative nightmare. But um, we also have 6.5 um, and substantive hours as well for this program for the Law Society. Um, the rooms you'll see are all here, so there's not, you won't get lost trying to find where the, the rooms for the concurrent sessions are. J125 and J130 are just outside the door on the right hand side down the hall. Um, and I know that there's been a few people who've just registered today. We, our lunches are box lunches because we're, we've only got a half hour and then we're going to have our lunch plenary. So I just ask the people who have registered today to just hold back to make sure that there's enough um, because uh, we may not have ordered a lunch for you. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm hoping there'll be enough for everyone who we'll just have to see. Anyway, welcome. Um, I wanted to also um, thank and acknowledge Tal Schreier, who's now out of the hall, so she can't get this acknowledgement, so I'll bring it back um, and, and mention it again when she's in the room because she has worked so tirelessly, and those of you who are um, uh, presenters will know they've had a lot of back and forth with Tal um, on uh, um, papers and, and I have to say that this is probably one of the first conferences that the Asper Center has organized where we pretty much got every single paper in advance of the day. <laughs> and those of you who have been present at academic conferences knows that, know that that's a big coup. So I want to thank all of the presenters for being very responsible. And so I don't want to take any more time away from our first panel, which um, is uh, an, an exciting and interesting panel. I'm going to turn it over to Reese Davies, uh, the Asper Center's public or um, constitutional litigator in residence to uh, chair that panel. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'm only going to give very brief introductions uh, to the speakers on this panel, which is about the um, recent litigation around uh, the use of solitary confinement in prisons uh, in Canada. Uh, you don't need much of an introduction from any of them and you certainly don't need, need me to get in the way. So I'm just going to say at my, at the far, uh, my far left um, is Lisa Kerr who is, as most of you probably know, an assistant professor at Queen's Law. She, studied, or she teaches criminal law, sentencing and prison law. She's also been involved um, with the litigation, both the BCCLA litigation and the John Howard Society uh, litigation around solitary confinement. In the middle, we have uh, Professor Kelly Adam Moffat, who is affiliated with the uh, Center of Criminology and Sociolegal Studies. She also uh, studies um, and writes about uh, penal strategies and penal uh, policy. Uh, she also, it's not in her bio, but she also was one of the witnesses at the Ashley Smith inquiry uh, that dealt with um, issues around solitary confinement. Uh, and beside me is Alison Latimer, who uh, is a partner at Arve Finley, who were counsel on the BC 
challenge to solitary confinement. Um, so they have uh, probably more knowledge than any combination of three people in this country about this issue. And so I'm just going to turn it over to them uh, to talk about the, uh, the litigation, how the BC case is different than the Ontario case, uh, where we may be going forward. So turn it over. I think Lisa's going. Oh, Allison's going first. Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so it falls to me to go first. I, I had the very great privilege to act for the plaintiffs in the recent uh, BC challenge to the uh, provisions of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act that authorized solitary confinement in Canadian penitentiaries. Um, I was acting for both the BC Civil Liberties Association and the John Howard Society, so two awesome institutional uh, plaintiffs with just a wealth of uh, knowledge and understanding about the issues that arose in that case. That case ultimately resulted in a judicial declaration in January of this year that those laws unjustifiably infringed sections 7 and 15 of the Charter. And the laws were struck down to the extent that they authorized, in effect, prolonged and indefinite solitary confinement for anyone, that they authorized, in effect, the warden to be the judge and prosecutor in his own cause, that they authorize internal review and authorize and affect the deprivation of an inmate's right to counsel at segregation hearings and reviews. They were also struck down to the extent that they deprive inmates of their equality rights, and in particular by authorizing and affecting any period of solitary confinement for mentally ill or disabled inmates and authorizing and affecting a procedure that results in discrimination against indigenous inmates. And those declarations of invalidity were suspended for a period of 12 months. And in the paper I prepared for this uh, conference, was it was an advocacy piece. And it was written at a time when it was unknown whether or not the Attorney General would be pursuing an appeal in the BC um, litigation. And I, what I did was I advocated that this case uh, presented a perfect opportunity for a constitutional dialogue um, and for a legislative correction. Uh, of this basically outdated and inhumane um, regime. But unfortunately, um, just after I submitted my paper on February 16th, uh, we were served with a notice of appeal in the, in the BC case. And so I was, I was getting ready to uh, make some remarks at this conference today, and I'm sort of bemoaning the fact that my paper had become stale dated, and <laughs> wondering what I would talk about, and um, I was complaining about this with some friends. And they thought it was just really crazy that I ever thought that the decision might not be appealed. <laughs> um, and so I thought uh, that that, that, uh, that reflection back to me about my paper was valuable. It reflected a really good understanding of how constitutional litigation ordinarily operates. That is, that there will always be an appeal. But I, I thought in this case, it actually highlights um, a misunderstanding or an information gap about the unique context of this particular case, what made it so challenging, and um, why I say I, I did honestly and non naively hold the view that the government might not appeal. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today in my uh, sort of 10 minutes. Um, so, in order to do that, I need to kind of go back, back to the beginning, which is when we filed this lawsuit, it was in January um, 2015. But the impetus for the case came much earlier than that. Um, you know, it dates back to the death of Ashley Smith in 2007. And you'll recall that she was a 19-year-old who died alone in her uh, solitary confinement cell after more than a year of solitary confinement. She wrapped a ligature around her neck and cut off the airflow. And um, CSC staff failed to respond. And ultimately, that failure cost her her life. And it was, it was deemed to be a homicide. And following that incident in 2008, the correctional investigator recommended that corrections implement independent adjudication of segregation placements of inmates with mental health concerns within 30 days of uh, placement. But corrections you know, rejected that recommendation. And there was also a, a coroner's inquest into her death. And in 2013, the verdict and over a dozen recommendations were made from that inqu inquest, and those were released. And key recommendations from that process included abolishment of indefinite solitary confinement and a prohibition on placing female inmates in solitary confinement in excess of 15 days. And corrections, of course, it also rejected those recommendations. And then two years after the release of the correctional investigator's report um, into Ms. Smith's death, uh, 
Another inmate, Edward Snowshoe, who was a 22-year-old Aboriginal man, hanged himself in his segregation cell after spending 162 days in solitary confinement. And then in 2015, in British Columbia, another man, Christopher Roy, whose father testified in our case, um, was found hanging by his neck in his solitary confinement cell after spending approximately two months in solitary confinement. So those are just sort of three examples um, that illustrated that there were really significant problems with solitary confinement, um, that those, although they were uh, brought to the attention of the uh, government, those were not being remedied at an institutional or a political level, and we, and we turned to the courts. But then we had reason to hope, because as I said, we filed the lawsuit in January, and then there was a federal election. And in November of 2015, the new Prime Minister, I think for the first time ever, um, made public the mandate letters that he issued to his ministers. And in the mandate letter that he issued to the uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General, he tasked her to conduct a review of changes in the criminal justice system, and stated that the outcomes of that process should include, among other things, implementation of the Smith recommendations. So we thought, well, that's great. <laughs> um, so we waited, because we thought, well, this will surely affect the litigation. But there was no uh, amendment to the pleadings in our case, and um, the, the litigation was defended on exactly the same basis that it always had been. So we uh, filed a notice to admit, and we asked the Attorney General to admit that it intended to implement the Ashley Smith recommendations as the mandate letter um, stated it should. And um, we thought that would significantly narrow the scope of the litigation. And the Attorney General uh, refused to make that admission. Um, so we, we weren't sure what to make of that, that uh, disconnect between the public position of the government and the litigation position. But there were other changes afoot that still caused hope to sort of spring eternal. There, was, uh, there were amendments to the Commissioner's Directive 709 that governed solitary confinement together with the Act and the regulations. And those revisions, um, you know, they included accelerated internal reviews of solitary placements. None of them prescribed a time limit uh, on the duration of segregation. They didn't uh, end its indefinite nature. But we did see the numbers of placements dropping and the length, duration, and segregation dropping. Um, so there was cause to be optimistic. We had initially set the trial for January of 2017. And in December, uh, the Attorney General came to court and uh, again caused us to be so hopeful um, because they represented that amendments to the laws and practice of solitary confinement were imminent and likely by the end of April. And so um, we consented to an adjournment of the trial, and the court, the court did adjourn the trial. And then by April, nothing happened. Um, there was no legislative change. There was no policy change. The trial was again set down, now for July. Now we were right up against the uh, judge's statutory retirement. We had to keep the trial moving. And then about two weeks before the trial, Canada introduced a bill into the House of Commons, Bill C-56. And this bill, um, you know, it presented a presumptive time limit of 21 days um, that could be overridden by the warden. It uh, introduced the idea of a reviewer who would review segregation placements and recommend whether inmates should be released. Um, those were only recommendations, though. And there was a further provision that after a year and a half, that 21-day time limit would go down to 15 days. And Corrections also said, look, in addition to this bill, we're going to amend the uh, commissioner's directives. Um, and those amendments were potentially significant. Um, it was going to prohibit the use of segregation for certain inmates with uh, serious mental disorders who suffer significant impairment, and inmates who were certified, um, and inmates who were at imminent risk of suicide and self-injury. And it also sort of improved some of the conditions of solitary confinement, more time out of cells, daily showers, immediate access to the inmates' personal effects. So in light of all of that, about a week before the trial was scheduled, um, and after we had organized all the witnesses coming from all over the world to come and testify, uh, the Attorney General again sought an adjournment, and we opposed it. Um, we opposed it. We said the bill and the Commissioner's directives didn't meet the challenge we had brought. They fell well short of that. And because of the sort of timing and the history that I've just gone through about these um, sort of insufficient abortive attempts to amend the legislation, um, we didn't feel that optimistic that those changes were coming. And the, and the court did uh, dismiss that application. And then, pretty much right on the eve of trial, the Attorney General uh, served us with uh, 
notice of application for leave to appeal uh, on an expedited basis. So their factum on the appeal on the German application. Um, we were in court on another matter and we could only respond to it just with a letter, um, just saying, this is crazy, we can't do this. Um, and the Court of Appeal uh, dismissed the application to expedite the leave to appeal application. So that meant that the leave to appeal application wouldn't be decided until after the trial was uh, concluded. And so ultimately it was, it was abandoned. So we did go to trial. And the BC trial spanned nine weeks. There were 28 witnesses cross-examined uh, before the court multiple expert witnesses on a range of subjects uh, relating to the practice and effects of segregation. And the court ultimately did identify sort of multiple constitutional deficiencies within the legislation itself, not how it was being administered. And after that decision came down, now the Minister of Public uh, Safety said in a statement that the government was going to identify further and better ideas that need to be incorporated into the reform package. So in light of that statement, I, I say it was, it was very, very disappointing to learn that Canada was in fact pursuing an appeal and not pursuing legislative uh, changes, which has been its stated intention since it uh, was elected in 2015. Um, it's a significant uh, outlay of public resources to pursue an appeal in litigation like this. And the bill has only passed first reading, so there's lots of time to fix it. Um, I say that a legislative response is actually closer in keeping with the government's most fundamental role as the primary protector of the public interest, and its publicly stated commitment to sort of sunny ways, and, um, and its publicly expressed will to reform the laws of practice of solitary confinement. And what would be needed to amend the bill um, so that it would comply with the judgment? Um, first of all, it would need to have hard time limits um, on the duration of administrative segregation. The judge in our case uh, described the 15-day uh, standard that's sort of been accepted internationally as a generous standard. So the time limit should certainly not be any longer than 15 days. It would need independent external review no later than five days after the placement decision. And that person would have to have um, authority to release the inmate from segregation. It would need to include assurance that inmates could have counsel at segregation review hearings. Um, it would need an absolute prohibition on subjecting mentally ill or disabled inmates to solitary confinement. You know, the new commissioner's directive that I mentioned that had this limitation on placing these people in solitary confinement was actually introduced after we closed our case in the solitary case. So we had to explore how it, how it operated in cross-examination in the government's case, which is always a bit scary. Um, and the judge found that it, you know, it fell short. It was too narrow. It was too vague. It wasn't being um, operationalized. The, any new framework would need to be designed and implemented to prevent discrimination uh, against indigenous inmates. The court identified um, some ideas about how improvements could be made. Parliament could certainly um, and should consult with the appropriate indigenous groups on the design and implementation of necessary amendments to the bill to fix that. And Justice Leask also said that inmates who seek segregation for their own protection, the so-called voluntary segregation cases, should not be held in solitary confinement at all people should be managed in a subpopulation. And he made findings about ways that the conditions of confinement in solitary confinement could be improved. Um, no more communicating through the food slot. It's just, it's inhumane. It's, um, it's like from a different century. And while we certainly uh, intend to vigorously defend the appeal, I do remain hopeful, uh, if no longer optimistic, that Canada will do what I say is the right thing and defend the constitutional rights of its most vulnerable populations, in this case, inmates, by amending the laws instead of dragging out the litigation. Thank you. Lisa, your turn. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's such a privilege to be on um, a panel with these three amazing women. Um, so I'm going to build off of Allison's remarks and spend most of my time identifying similarities and differences between the BC and Ontario decisions. And then at the end, I will briefly raise a concern that's always present in public interest litigation, and that's a concern with the risk of unintended consequences. So I'll close with some worries um, about the institutional and legislative responses that we might see following these cases. So first, what these two decisions agree on. Both courts, both BC and Ontario, reject the long-standing position from Corrections Canada that our prison system doesn't even use solitary. Okay. Both courts find that solitary can have severe effects on mental health, 
that was contested to a degree by Canada's experts. And both declared that the current rules governing the use of solitary are arbitrary and unfair and violate Section 7 and are, are struck, and the MNSEG laws are struck down on that basis. So those are the similarities. But I think the differences between the two cases are far more numerous and substantial than the similarities. So I'm going to deal first with two procedural issues, um, the issues of oversight and access to counsel. So on oversight, both decisions discuss the need for greater oversight at length. Both emphasize, as Allison has mentioned, the current regime allows prison wardens to review their own decisions to segregate. The Ontario court called this futile review, quote, an anomaly even within the context of penitentiary decision making. And I take that to mean even within the context of generally lame decision making. <laughs> um, it's pretty bad. Okay, so the Ontario court does not, however, hold that the additional oversight, the additional new review, has to be done by someone who's independent, who's not employed by the Correctional Service of Canada. Instead, CSC can do the extra review. But what I want to emphasize is that part of the decision in Ontario spans just six paragraphs. And in the only paragraph that attempts to justify or explain why the review can be done by CSC, the court actually cites the interests of inmates and their need for expediency in declining to order independent review. So it's a bit of a, frankly, under-reasoned part of the decision, and I think that will no doubt be central um, to uh, an appeal, potentially, in the CCLA appeal. Okay, uh, in contrast, the BC court spends 54 paragraphs, or 14 pages, discussing the history of calls for independent oversight of solitary and explaining why the prison culture needs a truly independent check. There's one simple explanation for the BC difference. Law professor Michael Jackson, who spent an enormous amount of his career on this issue of independent oversight, testifies, files an extensive report, testifies in the BC case. He doesn't appear in Ontario. Second, access to counsel. <coughs> so the BC court finds that the charter requires inmates to be able to have counsel present at segregation review boards. That really wasn't part of the Ontario claim, but it is worth noting that at paragraph 117 of the Ontario decision, the court seems to think inmates already have the ability to have counsel present at segregation review boards. So in that paragraph, the, the court refers to section 33 sub 2 of the act, the CCRA, but that provision says only that the inmate has the right to be present himself or herself. Um, the regulations um, say that the inmates have a right to retain and instruct counsel, and they regularly do with respect to their administrative segregation placements, but there is no provision for counsel to attend administrative segregation review boards. There is for disciplinary courts, so it shows that where Parliament wishes to protect the right to counsel or have counsel present, that Parliament knows what to do. Um, I've personally attempted to attend at, at MNSEG hearings and been denied. That's a common experience, and it's really no surprise because CSC does not tend to go above and beyond what law requires of them. Okay, so I'm going to turn now from those procedural issues to differences in terms of substantive limits on segregation. I think everyone who's been working seriously on these issues uh, for many years has been focused on two main issues, legislative time limits and a categorical prohibition on segregating vulnerable groups like the mentally ill. And I think the view there is that adding a bit of process without those substantive limits will not significantly or effectively reform solitary and it certainly will not abolish it. So as Allison has said, the BC court holds that the charter requires time limits on administrative segregation. Who brought a baby? <laughs> charter needs time limits and that the current system violates section 15 because of its unequal burdens on mentally ill inmates. Now, in much of the Ontario decision, the court accepts the facts, the same facts that caused the BC courts to re court to reach those conclusions. So for example, the Ontario court accepts evidence, much of it offered from prison employees, um, that a cap, that a time limit on the maximum amount of time that an inmate can be placed in solitary is achievable. The Ontario Court also notes things like the fact that Canada has been censured by the International Committee Against Torture for its prolonged its use of prolonged solitary, even on persons with mental illness. Notwithstanding these and related findings, the court declines to find that the legislation is invalid because it lacks time limits or because of how mentally ill people are treated and how they experience segregation. 
Why? Well, now we arrive at, I think, what is the most significant overarching difference between these two cases. Um, the Ontario court basically says that the problem is not with the legislation, but with its administration. And of course, this is not an individual complaint of maladministration, but a challenge to the legislation seeking a Section 52 declaration. So the court applies Little Sisters and says simply because this legislative scheme is open to maladministration, um, that's not a basis for striking the law. Because of this frame and this application of Little Sisters, the Ontario court looks only at the face of the legislation and asks whether it could ever be administered in a constitutional way. So to take one example of how this worked and the reasons, the Ontario court notes the presence of section 87 sub A of the CCRA. And that's a provision that says that the service is to take into account the health of offenders with respect to all decisions, including placement into administrative segregation. Now the, the court goes through and realizes, you know, sees, it's clear, this is not happening with administrative segregation. But the court says, well, the provision is there. So if, it, if the legislation were applied, if that provision were followed with respect to admin-site placements, then that would solve the problem. So the problem here is not with the face of the le legislation. Um, okay, so the BC court is also, of course, looking at the face of the legislation, um, but finds that the provisions themselves necessarily give rise to unconstitutional effects on the ground. Right? It's the laws that are authorizing the inhumane um, forms of isolation that the evidence uh, spoke to. It's the laws that fail to give an adequate standard for things like when an inmate is to be released from segregation. Um, even if a section like 87 sub A is utilized, even that provision, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't generate an adequate standard because it doesn't say what healthcare needs might preclude isolation. It simply says consider healthcare and decision making. So um, the BC court finds infirmities on the face of the legislation and says that those uh, flaws necessarily give rise to unconstitutional practices on the ground. So the court is really not taken with this, this interpretation or application of, of Little Sisters. There's many other examples in the Ontario decision of the court almost stretching to find that the current regime is or could be acceptable. For example, paragraph 259, the court begins this paragraph by noting the harms that accrue as segregation continues, and accepting that the initial screening mechanisms that CSE is using are faulty and do not prevent the segregation of mentally ill inmates. But then the court says that the applicant hasn't shown that subsequent monitoring isn't effective. The final sentence of paragraph 259 is this, quote, nor did the applicant suggest that the ongoing monitoring of inmates provided in the CSE's policies would be unable to detect deteriorating health. I find that grammar a little awkward, but I think that's telling. The court is not convinced that CSC policies would be unable to detect deteriorating health. I think it's a strange way of describing the applicant's burden, but it also presumes that CSC will respond adequately when they do detect deteriorating health and segregation. And I think a great deal of evidence filed in both cases suggests otherwise. Contrast that with the BC approach where the judge really eschews formalism of this kind and interrogates the various policies and protections that CSC says protect people in segregation. At paragraph 93, for example, the court notes that 14 of the inmates who died by suicide in segregation between 2011 and 2014 had completed the suicide risk checklist and had been seen by a healthcare professional. Inmate Christopher Roy, whose father Robert testified for the plaintiffs, completed the checklist, he answered no, uh, to each of the questions posed, he hanged himself in his cell two months later while still in administrative segregation. So as my final set of comparisons on this theme, at paragraph 233, the Ontario court finds that a daily visit by a nurse is, quote, sufficient to negate the potential cruelty of indefinite segregation. The BC court says this at paragraph 139, quote, as I understand the evidence of witnesses describing the behavior of wardens, correctional staff, psychologists, and nurses, most individuals that interact with inmates in at MinSeg simply stand erect outside the inmate cells, speak to the inmates without making eye contact, and rely on their voices being heard through the food slot. I consider this behavior to be demeaning and inhumane. Let me turn briefly to the Section 15 analysis um, from BC with respect to Indigenous inmates. The BC court spends a great deal of time discussing how solitary violates equality protections because of its disproportionate impacts on indigenous inmates. 
The BC Court focused specifically on the experience of Indigenous women, thanks in large part to the intervention by LEAF at the trial level. Indigenous women make up 50% of segregation placements in women's prisons. And the evidence was that they tend to suffer more distress in the deprived conditions of segregation due to their health and their personal histories. So the BC decision reminds the federal government that any new solitary laws will impact Indigenous people in distinct and disproportionate ways. The Ontario decision does not mention Indigenous people. The case was not brought that way. That evidence was not put before the judge. So my final point on comparing the two cases is about the lack of inmate voices in the Ontario decision. As far as I understand, uh, three in inmate affidavits were filed. The only reference to inmate evidence is at paragraph 139, but the reference is not to their experiences under these laws. Rather, the court mentions only the criminal records of the three affiants. The evidence is cited only to prove the point that prisons are full of very difficult people. Even under the Section 12 analysis, there is no reference to the evidence of any person subjected to the practice. And I find that very striking because the, the, the idea, the concept of cruel and unusual punishment is really about the experience of it, the phenomenology, or the lived reality of it. In contrast, inmate evidence appears throughout the BC decision, and not only that, inmate experiences are believed and are taken seriously. Paragraphs 399 to 410, this is actually like what I found to be the most powerful bit of evidence in the whole case, shows how an inmate named Blair experienced 79 days of segregation and how the warden who reviewed the decision to segregate Mr. Pike employed circular and arbitrary reasoning in continuing the segregation. I commend those paragraphs to you. Mr. Pike, this warden, testified at trial and was still at trial justifying his decision to segregate Blair. Justice Leask used this account as a basis for departing from the Ontario conclusion that CSC can fairly review its own decisions to segregate. So in my last couple of minutes, I want to close with a couple of concerns about the risks that litigation can bring unintended consequences. I think this is one of the most important topics for all of us to be thinking about, um, no matter what kind of cases we're bringing. So there's a large body of scholarship from the US on prisoner litigation that shows how litigation uh, from the 1970s onward has transformed but has not abolished techniques of repression and control. Robert Perkinson, in an excellent book named Texas Tough, describes how the prisoner rights movement in Texas courts ended crude forms of abuse and neglect, but that this period also saw the increase of closed circuit televisions, more frequent use of tear gas, sophisticated locking systems, and unit management that sought to limit inmate movement and contact. Perkinson describes how litigated reform in Texas led to the expansion of prison infrastructure, unprecedented allocation of funds in the state budget to prison administration, and discretionary and, and um, the elimination of pockets of leniency, right, um, in terms of informal relationships with staff and discretionary exceptions to prison rules. Between 1968 and 2005, the Texas imprisonment rate grew by 1,300%. The prison budget went from 20 million to 2.6 billion. Throughout this period, the legal recognition of prisoner rights expanded, and the Texas prison system was under almost constant judicial super supervision. Karamat Ryder's research on the rise of supermax prisons in California similarly shows how judicial intervention on the topic of prisoner isolation in the 1960s and 70s may have contributed to the design and proliferation of supermax prisons in the 1980s and 90s. In the first period of litigation in the 60s and 70s, courts articulated limits on isolation, mostly relating to the physical conditions in which prisoners were held. While these decisions did establish a number of constraints on isolation, the cases also specified the exact conditions under which isolation would be permissible. This judicial reproach, approach, writer argues, contributed to the development of the modern supermax. Now, there is a lot more to say about these stories of unintended consequences from even successful litigation. There's lots you can say to say that, you know, litigation was not the cause of these issues and so on. But I think my point is that I don't think that worrying about that kind of thing means you don't bring cases. Um, I do think it means that you have, should have a deep understanding of the institutions, laws, and practices that you're trying to change before filing pleadings. 
courts must render decisions on the basis of the material in front of them. And in the segregation context, litigation runs the risk of generating what writer calls, quote, a roadmap for constitutional segregation. The worry that arises from the Ontario decision, should it be upheld or should it lead the way on these issues, is that adding an internal procedural review is extremely unlikely to reduce the arbitrariness and the harm that both the Ontario and BC courts found embedded in our use of administrative segregation. Thank you. Kelly. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up a little bit on some of the comments that both Lisa and Allison made. And I have a PowerPoint now, but if I can yeah. Okay, so I'm not gonna follow the PowerPoint too, too closely, but Part of it is to just sort of give you a little bit of an imagery about what it is that we're talking about and to break this up a little bit. Um, not being a lawyer, but rather a social scientist who's been working on this issue for 25 years from the Arbor Commission through to providing expert reports for both of these cases as well as Ashley Smith and the current case of Adam Pei, who in Ontario has been in segregation for about four years um, during his pretrial confinement. I think it's really important for us to think a little bit about some of the things that Lisa said at the end of what is it that we're litigating and what is the consequence and the institutional response to these things and what are some of the broader ongoing issues that would be prudent to think about and consider as we move through these things. And I agree with Lisa and I'll say at the very beginning that I think it's very, very important to litigate these issues. We're at a particular moment in time historically where there is a lot of litigation that's going on. So when we're talking about segregation, just to sort of have a baseline before I go through some of the ongoing issues to leave time for discussion, what we're talking about is people who are being confined into cells that are 8 by 10 feet, about the size of a parking space. We're talking about a space where work, education, rehabilitation, programming are <coughs> non-existent, where television, radios, reading materials may or may not be permitted. I would say to you and suggest to you that new legislation that suggests a little bit more time out of a cell like this is probably not necessarily um, the most prudent um, thing or that will make a meaningful impact on the experience. A lot of times we see lockdown at 23-7 or potentially now 22-7 and we have prisoners spending long periods of time in these enclosed spaces. The meal slots that people are talking about in terms of where the observation is done and where people are talking through are food slots that are commonly used for communication, medication, treatment, and also sometimes psychotherapy. Sometimes psychological visits or assessments that are reported to occur happen through these meal slots in public spaces. So some of the misconceptions about segregation, and I think as we talk about litigating these issues, it's important to look at the broader public rhetoric around some of the concerns around segregation. So one of the things is that it's not just for dangerous prisoners. It's not just the difficult to manage, but it's also for those who are at risk for reasons of mental illness, developmental disabilities, age, and also former gang law enforcement affiliation, sexual vulnerability, or gender nonconformity, and also individuals who are there pending an investigation of a particular incident or self-injury. Legislation does not necessarily disaggregate between the types of prisoners who end up in administrative segregation, or even for that matter, disciplinary segregation. When we talk about vulnerable populations and the placement of vulnerable populations, restricting the use of segregation on vulnerable populations is always unclear as to who is that vulnerable population. One of the issues that is important to consider as we go through legislation, as we read these decisions, and we see prohibitions about, against the use of segregation on mentally ill prisoners is the very simple question of who is mentally ill. It's completely unclear um, by CSC standards who constitutes as having a mental illness. In some cases, the severely disabled cognitively impaired individuals who have an access one disorder are very easily defined as mentally ill, partly because of their illusions, partly because of their behavior is so off the map that most normal people would say, yes, there's something wrong with this individual. But it's the individuals that hover on that cusp of are they just disorderly, resistant, disobedient, manipulative, or are they mentally ill? A large cohort of those individuals end up being individuals who self-harm. A large proportion of those are women who are in solitary confinement. 
and also individuals who are seen as resistant to institutional order or have difficulty coping with the institutional environment. We see many prisoners then being considered to be nuisance prisoners and their disruptive behavior becomes some of the things that end up leading to segregation. Safety and security is also a very elusive term. You will often hear the government speaking about issues around safety and security. But there is little empirical evidence to show that segregation actually increases the safety of a facility and that its absence would increase in prison violence. So even though we continue to put limits on time frames of segregation, what we are talking about is not having segregation at all. And what would it look like if we were having an institution without segregation? And there have been moments in Canadian history where we have not had segregation in federal facilities that have housed a wide range of prisoners and remarkably, we've been able to manage that population without the use of isolation. We also see that, in general, there is no evidence that there's a deterrent effect on the prison population in general or individuals specifically through the use of segregation. Now, I'm not going to go through um, this literature in detail, and it's on the PowerPoints if you choose to look at it, but rather I want to skip to some of the ongoing issues um, with respect to segregation. So despite the long established consensus among researchers that solitary confinement damages, what we see in these legal cases and in the cross-examinations that occur is a very consistent and persistent tendency to minimize the empirical evidence um, that shows that there are negative impacts on placing people in solitary confinement, sometimes for as little as 48 hours. I find it remarkable that this has been able to withstand time given the pervasiveness of evidence suggesting not only that segregation can cause mental health um, issues, but also that it can cause symptoms of mental health problems, it can exasperate mental health issues, it can minimize the effectiveness of antipsychotropic drugs, it can lead to suicide ideation, it can lead to self-injury and produce a whole host of difficulties for individuals. But nonetheless, consistently, um, whether it's at the time when I've spent with Arbor and the Arbor Commission or in the Asha Smith Inquest or in BC, you get asked questions to say, isn't it true that this one study that is really poorly done with lousy methodology shows there is no evidence of mental health effects? And it's like, well, I don't know. There's probably hundreds of other ones that tell you that there are. Lots of people are standing here giving evidence showing you that they are. And if you just kind of hang out in there for 48 hours with the door closed and we treat you the way we treat individuals in there, you probably would think there was a bit of an impact. Um, but nonetheless, this persistently becomes a line of questioning. Along with silly questions like, wouldn't you agree that placing somebody in restraints um, in solitary confinement is better than death? Well, no, I actually wouldn't. And why wouldn't I? Not that I would purport or advocate death but rather that it's predictable. After long periods of time and 30 years of research, we know what's going to happen, and we know that this is not an effective population management instrument, yet it continues to be a preferred tool of population management. So continuing to have segregation, limiting it, changing, tinkering, playing with the legislation and policy reform, allows a technique of confinement to persist that continues to perpetuate harm. Now, all that being said, this is not to say that we don't need accountable external oversight, and what we probably may or may not need is necessarily more policy. Because the other thing that we persistently have seen when we look through these cases, and one of the very few times that you actually get a glimpse into how CSC works, is by working on one of these cases, or doing work in projects where we get disclosure, is you see a litany of reports that come out of CSC, whether they're segregation reports, observation reports, use of force reports, situational incident reports, all of which document in compliance to policy. But nonetheless, somebody continues to stay in segregation for a very long period of time, but all the boxes are ticked. And the oversight of those reports and those pieces of evidence to show that for complying with policy are very difficult to contest. Um, so one of the problems that I see in more policy reform, more oversight that's requiring more reports on showing how you've done it, how you follow policy, is that it also has this unintended consequence of showing compliance, and showing compliance in a large majority of the cases. And this is where 
If something happens, which I've argued, is rights become risks to be organizationally managed. The risk is litigation and it's reputational risk management. CSC does not want to be seen as an institution, nor does the Ontario um, provincial systems in any of the provinces in the country want to be as systems that are constitutionally violating the rights of the individuals whom they contain. But nonetheless, um, that is what appears to be happening in many cases. So solutions are often revised policy, but policy remains woefully inadequate and also leads to various forms of the institutional risk <coughs> management. There's a historic pattern of routine violations of policy and law, and if you haven't read it, I would strongly suggest going back to reading Madam Justice Arbor's report um, in the mid-1990s where she speaks about the lack of a culture of adherence to law. Um, and this lack of a culture of adherence to law um, is one that continues to be pervasive. So I'll give you an example. The new legislation that came through as Allison was litigating the BC case, um, one of the commission's directives was 709, which prohibits the use of administrative segregation for those with serious mental health or significant impairment. Now if you go into that CD, there's a click right in to CD 843, which is titled Interventions to Preserve Life and Prevent Serious Bodily Harm. It's a mechanism to manage the subset of individuals that actually have mental health issues that remain in correctional custody. It contains no time limits. It enables ongoing use of penal restraints, which you can see um, in this picture. And it also it enables the use of a penal restraint, which the Ontario Correctional, or the Office of the Correctional Investigator will call a use of force, but CSC only calls a use of force if there's a problem in the application of the restraint. Um, these are the very same restraints that Ashley Smith was kept in, in solitary confinement for protracted periods of time, and that other prisoners are currently being held in custody in segregation cells, much like the one above, in these types of restraints. I don't really think that's progress, um, but nonetheless. Limiting the need for time out is another issue. So one of the other issues that was raised is the issue around voluntary segregation. Some prisoners use segregation to escape general population. Therefore, we need to continue segregation. Well, as it was suggested, the decisions say, well, perhaps we need ranges. Well, perhaps we have a bigger problem with general population if prisoners need to go into segregation for a time out from general population. Again, it is a different but related problem of asking bigger questions about are we perpetuating a very repressive technique on the basis that some people might need it to feel safe in an institution where their safety ought to be assured and preserved. We also need to focus a little bit on the gateways to segregation, not just segregation itself. And some of those gateways to segregation would still have constitutional issues, in my opinion, are things like security classification. Uh, which have serious issues with respect to gender and indigenous peoples and for which we need to pay more attention. And this would be the general issue of risk assessment. Who's classified maximum security? Who's seen risky? Who's seen as in need of these particular types of confinement? Also, access to information as another point. Um, a consequence, perhaps unintended or otherwise, of litigation is that it allows for access to information from an institution an institutional structure where it is increasingly difficult to get information about practice. Um, it is very hard to find out what happens inside institutions, which makes creating an evidence base difficult, and litigation and producing affidavits, having public records, actually helps a lot of social scientists, researchers, look at what is actually happening in these institutions, because it is sometimes the first time that we have evidence that's being produced by the government which they can't then say is biased, um, because of course they produce it. However, how you get it, what you get, you have to be very cautious about how you ask for it. Um, so for example, one of the things we couldn't tell in the BC case is how many indigenous women are in segregation. We could tell you how many indigenous people were in segregation, how many women were in segregation, but not indigenous women in segregation because we didn't ask that question. Uh, so we couldn't disaggregate the data. Um, it's also useful to educate and build, and this is perhaps a contentious and out of the box suggestion, but I think it's useful to educate and build common ground with correctional unions in terms of occupational health and safety laws, staff models and training, and changes to collective agreements. It's very interesting when you actually speak to correctional officers about how they perceive solitary confinement. You will get this, there are dangerous people and we you know, need to be safe in our institutions, 
But there's also issues around these types of facilities, lack of accommodation for mentally ill people, producing unsafe working conditions, all of which to the end goal of saying we need to do something about the conditions of confinement. We also need to look at collective agreements. So for example, on some of the Ontario collective agreements, you will see things where people who are placed in segregation cells to deal with some of the most difficult people are there based on seniority rights. Um, so if you have seniority rights, you don't have to work in that unit. So you get the least experienced person who might be part-time, who's never been in that institution before, has no relationship with the prisoners, is now in a particular unit with individuals exhibiting problematic behavior. Conflict resolution is going to be minimal and weak at best in those kinds of circumstances. So if you have collective agreements that structure work in a particular way, limit training, don't adhere to um, best practices in terms of training, then you're also dealing with people who are very ill-equipped. So just to move um, quickly, actually I'm done with that because I think I passed it, but just to sort of end with this is that even though I think these are two really important decisions, I'm not quite sure because I'm not a lawyer what's going to happen to them when they get to the appeal court. Hopefully they get up to the Supreme Court and somebody once, or, once and for all actually um, pronounces on this particular practice. But we have to be conscious that even if that does happen, it doesn't mean that the issue goes away. It continues to be there and persists. Um, seeing and saying things like there's fewer people in segregation is a little bit of a musical chairs kind of problem. So we know that the occupancy rate in those seg cells has not changed. But we do know that what segregation is being called changes radically over time, which brings me very back to the first slide, which is it's all precarious, whether it's solitary segregation, super max and enhanced observation, quiet time, clinical seclusion, or timeout, it's still the same box. And we still have people occupying those cells regardless of what it is that we call it. So I'll leave that. Thank you. Um, we have, looks like, just about five minutes left, so we're going to open it up for questions or comments uh, on this topic. Yeah. Hi. I'm legal counsel for the Native Women's Association of Canada, and I was wondering, what, how can we get an intersectional Section 15 analysis for gender and race, um, let's say on appeal in the BC case or in Ontario? No, I, I heard. Did people at the back hear that question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'll take a, I'll take a, I'll take a first stab at it. I mean, I think the nice thing about the BC case is that that evidence is available on the record, and an intersectional analysis was argued in the trial court, although the trial judge declined to engage in it. Exactly. So I, I, I so I, I think that. I think that does open it up for that kind of argument to be advanced on appeal and for, I, mean, I don't think that's outside the bounds of what an intervener can do on an appeal. How to convince the court to to actually go there, I don't know, good advocacy, I guess. I don't have anything to add to that, I agree with that. Yeah, it's the Canadian Human Rights Commission is now looking at this particular issue in terms of doing a gendered analysis of segregation and the way in which that intersects with other axes um, around Section 15, so disability in terms of mental health as well as indigeneity. Um, one of the challenges, and I, I think this is going to be raised also in the LMP case, um, one of the challenges is that when you look to empirical evidence, it's hard to show any literature that indicates differential effects on Indigenous people because there's not a lot of research. In fact, internationally there's almost none. But it's not hard to extrapolate from Blue principles and from other kinds of arguments about historical trauma and intergenerational violence and other issues, and also the over incarceration of individuals, of indigenous, indigenous individuals in solitary generally, and women in particular. I would only add to that I think every case that is about a prison policy uh, has is a case that, about the indigenous, disproportionate yeah. impact on indigenous yeah, people. Yeah. You can't separate it. Right, so yeah. that, those arguments should be made in every case, and they've appeared in interesting ways, in, you know, from prisoner voting um, to the English decision around mother-baby programs. Um, you know, it's not necessarily always going to be a Section 15 victory. Um, certainly wasn't in the trial court in BC, but at least those issues were present, and they did impact the analysis in, in some ways. No, go. Sure. 
of shaping that analysis and shaping that, that part of the story. Maybe I'll leave that to Allison. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I think I agree with what, with what Lisa said, which was that it was really Professor Jackson's evidence. I don't know if you've met him, but he's an extremely um, sort of articulate, charming person who spent, you know, a couple days on the stand being cross-examined all about his expert report, which was basically look back through, from the beginning of the <laughs> history of penitentiaries in Canada and, and just every single uh, report and every <coughs> single time a court or anybody called for independent review and what happened with that. Um, and he was so impactful, uh, impactful for the court. All we could do was say, you know, it's what, it's what Professor Jackson said. <laughs> I meant his report to you, it was very long. Um, and tried to, you know, try to highlight some points from it. Um, did the interveners uh, pick up on that? I, I'm not sure. Um, I think I think Professor Jackson himself was uh, was the was the leading light on that issue. And I, I can tell you that I, I bet you anything that even the government lawyers at the end of his evidence regretted seeing him leave that courtroom because the man is he's wonderful to listen to. He's hugely knowledgeable. He's hugely respectful of everyone who works in the prison system along with the inmates. Um, there's one article he wrote called I think it's called something like Independent Adjudication as the Litmus Test for Prison Legitimacy, and it documents the history of of the calls for independent adjudication and how CSC has resisted it for years and years and years. And there's been like pilots and they fail. And the, the amount that CSC resists having someone who's not one of their own employees check their decisions, even like if there were no time limits, they still don't want independent review. That tells you something. Why do they not want it so much? They have independent oversight of their disciplinary court system. And the evidence showed that 2% of inmates in segregation went through that system. So they don't send, and who makes the decision whether you go disciplinary at bin? CSC. So they don't send people through disciplinary because they don't want that independent oversight plus the other rights associated with the disciplinary regime. So that article, it's, it's, it's a mercifully short piece, which is unusual for Michael. <laughs> but I like just as my He has a lot to say. Uh, looks like we're at the end of our session, so please join me in thanking these amazing panelists. Thank you very much. Now we don't have much time in between, in fact no 